Welcome to this 37 Plays Masterclass. We're thrilled to be joining you today at the Grand Theatre Blackpool. My name is Rebecca Latham and I am the Deputy Literary Manager at the Royal Shakespeare Company. Thrilled to be joined today by playwright and actor Jack Holden. Um, Jack's debut play, Cruise, opened for its first one in the West End in May 2021 and is set to return to the West End from the 13th of August this year. Jack also performs in the show and will be on stage again for its second run. Cruise is based on a true story that Jack heard when he was volunteering for the Switchboard, which is the LGBT plus listening service. Jack was a participant at the Royal Court Young Writers Group, and he currently has several plays and screen projects in development. Today's conversation will mostly be concerned with characterization. We wanted to talk to Jack about how he thinks of characters, both in their conception and their function, how he develops them and what he hopes for when he puts them in front of an audience. Firstly, perhaps we should start by defining what we mean when we talk about compelling characters. What does that phrase mean to you, Jack? Um, yeah, I think compelling characters is a good word rather than interesting characters. I think compelling is, is quite an active word. It, make, it makes you it compels you to think something or to question something or to wonder. And that's what we want our audience to do whenever we present a character is to start asking questions about them and about where they've come from, about where they're going, about what they want, about what they're scared of. Um, so I don't think it's about uh, necessarily a fully realized character or an, in an incredibly detailed character. I think it's about them having something intriguing in them that sparks something in the audience that might be um, a way they speak or a way they hold themselves or something we can see in their eyes something that's happened we could they, they, they carry something onto stage or they or they reference something in what they say or there's something that they're clearly not saying or there's something that they're obsessed about talking about and we're sort of wondering why that is where that comes from and as an audience as a good audience what we normally do when someone walks onto stage is immediately try and work out what the story is. My favourite theatre is theatre that leaves lots of gaps for the audience to answer. So my very first acting job was in the play War Horse. And it's such a wonderful piece because it is the, the star of the show is the puppets. And puppets, by definition, require the audience to suspend their disbelief, to fill in the gaps, literally fill in the gaps in the puppet and imagine that it's a real horse in that example. And the same goes for characters played by actors when they walk onto stage. We immediately want to fill in the gaps. And a compelling character has a couple or a few features about them that make us really hungry to learn more about them. That's a really good introduction to how we're going to consider characters today. Um, Jack, you recently took part in a film that we did for the 37 Plays project where we spoke more about character. In that film, you describe a playwright's role as creating an anchor for an actor. So providing fundamental aspects of a character for an actor to expand on. And I wondered if we could dig a little deeper into that. Uh, in the film, you say people enter our lives all the time. We don't know every detail about them. So when writing characters, what's the fundamental thing that you do need to know about them in order to understand them as the writer? Yeah, the fundamental things you need for a character, I think, are what they want. And that could be, in the moment, what they want from the scene, the exchange they're in currently. And we all want something all the time. And that's what you've got to remember when you're writing drama, is that all your characters want something all the time. Um, they want peace, they want uh, chaos, they want uh, another person in the room, they want to get away from here. There's always something going on, there's always a motor underneath them. So knowing that is really important. Nobody speaks without reason. Um, I'm speaking to you now because I have to, <laughs> and I'm enjoying it. Um, and, you know, it, it, every s single interaction of our life is transactional on some level. Um, 
So that's an anchor. Um, an opposing force is another anchor, something that stops them from getting what they want. A again, this could be in their, their super objective, is what we call it, their, their, their whole life objective, what they want out of life. And that's quite a big idea. And that's, you know, we, we don't all go around day to day wondering what it is that we want out of life. We break that down into smaller increments to get to where we want to be. Um, but there are things stopping us, and it's those challenges, that friction that, you know, often compels us to try harder or to change ourselves or to try a different tactic. And the same is true for a character we generate. And then it's their uniqueness as well. It's, their, it's the sort of idiosyncrasies about them. And um, in my play Cruise, there was about 40 characters, all of whom I played, and um, I couldn't possibly have delivered fully fleshed out, fully backstoried, detailed characters. It was es the essence of characters that I had to deliver. And again, trusting that your audience will fill in the gaps and imagine something uh, that will do the storytelling for you. So objective, what they want, obstacles, the things that are holding them back, that gives them dynamism. And then the idiosyncrasies, the details, the uniqueness about them. And as the writer, do you need to know those fundamental traits before you start writing? Or do you sort of learn about the character as you're developing them? I think, I, personally, I learn about them as I go. And, I, and it's, it's often in making that character speak and sort of playing God with them for a bit. But you learn a lot about them. And then you might go, actually, that doesn't sound like what they'd really say or how they'd actually behave in that scenario. And sometimes you write a scene and you think, it's a bit boring, nothing's really happening. It's because you haven't given them wants or needs and those, those don't need to be in opposition if you've got two characters in a scene, but it kind of helps usually. So if a scene is feeling flat, you sometimes have to interrogate, does it have, are there people pursuing things that they want in it? Um, yeah. So this next question sort of leads into that. Mm. In order for a character to be compelling, do you think they have to change throughout the course of a sort of complete play or story? Is that an essential rule when it comes to character? Interesting. I think as an actor, speaking as an actor now, it's really... <laughs> when you get a, a part where a character goes through a real change, it's very satisfying to play that. To, see how far someone goes across a play. Um, Othello goes from being, you know, a man in control of himself, high status, in control of his life, uh, respected, powerful, to destroyed and, you know, nothing. Uh, those kind of journeys are always very exciting for actors and I think for audiences as well. Um, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is it a rule? That for a character to oh, be right, okay. compelling, they have Thank to you. go through a change. Right. And I guess when I say character, I mean the central character. Right. Okay. Well, that's yeah, that's interesting because sometimes as an actor, obviously you get parts that are that feel quite functional. They come into the story to affect change on the central character. So you're more of a device, which is slightly less satisfying to play, but it's necessary. If you're a central character, if you want them to go on a change, they have to be changed by something or someone. So there are going to have to be characters that come in and affect those changes. Um, so basically what I'm saying is it's, it's, it's better to be the main part. <laughs> but those characters, your central character, fundamentally probably will, will go through a change in your play. I think that will, that will instinctively happen. If you throw people together, change is gonna come. <laughs> How do you feel about rules in general when you're writing? And can you think of any other rules when it comes to considering character? I think rules and character don't necessarily go together because humans rarely fit a mold or, you know, rules. <laughs> um, we're contradictory, as I was saying earlier. I think we're, we are a ball of contradictions and we surprise other people and disappoint other people and we surprise and disappoint ourselves and 
I think if we think about times we've let ourselves down, it's maybe when we acted irrationally or um, out of character or when someone who thought they knew us was surprised at something we did. Um, and those are the most shocking times in our lives, often when people don't do as we thought they might. And that is what makes great drama. That's what is the juicy stuff to watch, is when people cross a line, they cross the Rubicon, they do something that they can't take back. And we watch them, we watch them do that, and we watch them betray themselves, uh, or betray someone else's perception of themselves. So I think, in character terms, we want to break those rules, that's the key. The rules that really help me in writing are things about structure and are about th th those, that rule I said basically is that there's an objective, an obstacle, and th th those are the motors of the scene. It's, it's, it's less a rule, it's more just checking that they're there. Um, yeah. And have you found, and maybe you can use Cruz as an example, have you found in the past that there have been characters who you found particularly slippery to write? And it might be that their objective changes as you're writing them or you sort of misunderstood them when you started off building relationship with that character. Are there easy characters for you to write versus ones that you find more slippery or sort of unknowable? Mm. Yeah, I mean, in. Uh, in, in some ways, like a central character can be harder to write because a, a, a functional character comes in and you need them to do something. You need them to affect a change or deliver some bad news or to mess up this person's life. Um, what's, what can be harder is charting your sort of central character's journey through this and really trying to interrogate how they would respond to this. And the only way you really know is by trying stuff out and, you know, drafting a scene, it doesn't quite feel right, it doesn't quite feel how that character would operate, discard it, try again, try a different version of it. Um, slippery characters. <laughs> I mean, like the word slippery. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I guess I have a second question if it helps, which might expand on. on that, which is how do you approach writing characters whose experience mm. is very different from your own or their perspective on politics or uh, social issues is very different from your own. Okay, yeah, that is that helps. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah so for example, Cruz uh, was based on a true story I'd heard, but I that made a ver made up a very small part of the structure of it, and then I imagined loads more, um, and I drew on all sorts of different sources for my characters. I drew on my entire cultural history of, you know, of, of queer history, what I sort of, the things I love, the, the drag queens and the uh, Quentin Crisps and the sort of, all of the vivid, colourful characters from, from queer history. Um, I was born in 1990, so I didn't live in the 80s, but the play was majority set in the 80s. So I did plenty of research and these characters sprung out from history that I sort of thought, oh, I'll take a bit of that, I'll throw in a bit of that character. And then I spoke to a couple of um, my older friends who, who were sort of, you know, in, in their 20s, in the 80s, and lived in London and dabbled in the Soho scene, and they could tell me all about it. And the things that they told me that were so valuable weren't, oh, the Coach and Horses was there, and oh, this pub was there, and that club was there. It was, my friend Richard said something that was so small but it, was, it informed so much of the play which was that when he used to walk down old Compton Street in the middle of Soho there was a lot less glass than there is now as in the windows were all you know there were small windows and shut doors and people looking through hatches to see who you were to, before they let you in whereas now it's all glass fronted shops and cafes and which says a lot about the progress of a place and the atmosphere of a place over time and how that's changed and how that would inform how people move through that space. It was a tiny textural detail, but it helped so much. And his personal memories of a bar, his attitude towards a bar that he hated but always seemed to end up in. And then I gave that to a character, that attitude towards that place. And it gave it so much more texture 
rather than just listing off the different bars and clubs of Soho, it, there was attitude towards place and there was, you know, places they loved and places they hated and places they were scared of. Um, have I gone off message? No, 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 you're completely on message. <laughs> I guess I have a, a little bumper question. Yeah, go on. How did you nail the sort of slang or vernacular of that time period? Like what sort of research did you do into that? Um, well, yes, if I mean... You, if you did, I don't know if you Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I suppose, I, yeah, there's a lot of characters in the show with a lot of different experiences and they come from different places and um, I attempt lots of different accents. Um, and one character in particular uh, speaks a lot of Polari, um, you know, which was a sort of uh, queer sort of coded language um, with a bit of um, uh, Cockney rhyming slang thrown into it and a bit of um, Yiddish as well, all mixed up in there. Which is the monologue that we've included at the end of the 37 yeah, Plays yeah. film. So if you're interested yeah. in seeing the monologue that Jack is speaking about, you can watch it on that film that yeah. we've prepared. And it's this character called, that I called Polari Gordon, and he's got a lot of Quentin Crisp about him. He's very well turned out in a maroon three-piece suit and a matching hat, and he sits in the Colony Room Club, which is a now disappeared old little smoky den up some stairs. And uh, the research about that place was that it had this little kind of honky-tonk organ in the corner and it was all painted this like sort of horrible dark green. So I could immediately imagine the atmosphere of that place. And once you can imagine the atmosphere of the place that this character hangs out in all the time, you get a sense of who he is and why he doesn't go anywhere else. And the main character stumbles into this space and Polari Gordon is sort of surprised and enchanted by this young man who's turned up and decides to take him under his wing for an hour and buy him a gin and tonic and hear all his problems. And He's this sort of fairy godmother style character. And um, yeah, he's a sort of, he comes into his life to lift him up from the very bottom of his despair. And so he's a functional character, but he's also magical and unusual and speaks in this strange language. So, so his vernacular, his jargon, completely informed who he was and and, and why he was useful and exotic to throw into the story at that stage. Very good. Um, I know that you've mentioned a little bit about how you were inspired to write crews. Typically, when you're writing projects, do you tend to be inspired by real people? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah. I'm, 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 what I use is reality as the germ or as the, I don't know, the middle of the snowball and then I sort of roll it around and add to it um, and I have you know a, a whole library of characters that I thought were going to make it into something and then they just didn't and I discarded them but I didn't throw them away I kept them <laughs> um, I either kept you know the, the half play I'd written or the character profile I'd written and and consciously came back to it or stumbled across it one day and then they thought, oh, I could use that part of them and use them there. Um, and yeah, I, I guess in terms of real people, I mean, I've played real people in plays and um, I, <laughs> uh, and that's a really interesting thing because those are, you know, those are real people who lived and were full 3D humans, but I will still never be able to directly replicate them. Um, I mean, there's a, you know, an actor called Bertie Carvel who's playing Donald Trump and at the Old Vic at the moment, he's just finished. And he, he gets about as close as anyone can in modern theatre at the moment to, to, to nailing these characters. He gets so close. And in fact, I was in a play with him at the Almeida a few years ago um, where he was playing Rupert Murdoch. And all the reviews were about his take on Ru Rupert Murdoch, about how, whether it was accurate or whether it was too much or whether it wasn't enough, which is incredible because he's a real person. And um, he was playing him, the version of him from 1969. I was playing the first page three photographer. Um, and, with an uh, excellent wig. With a, an excellent wig, uh, really long, dark hair. Uh, he never looked like that at all. The costume designer, uh, the, the designer came along and said, uh, I think he should look like this. I think we want him to functionally represent uh, 
the end of the 60s, the beginning of the 70s, then, you know, the new age. And I was like, cool. I mean, you know, give me the wig straight away. Um, so he didn't look anything like the real character did, but, you know, Mike, I've, I've acted him. I felt like I was a, you know, a three-dimensional character, even if it wasn't accurate to the original. Um, there's then a funny story about the daughter of that <laughs> real person coming to watch the show and being very upset with me because I hadn't portrayed her father very well. But, um, hey, it's theatre. You know, we're not, we're not trying to make a facsimile of real people. We're, we're, we're putting theatrical versions on stage. So if you do include real people, I don't think worry about it being to the letter. Um, and if you use parts of real people to inspire imagined people, that's, that's the way I go, yeah. Yeah, I guess it's like the intention with those characters as well. So yeah. with the Trump character that Bertie plays, it feels like, uh, like by like, uh, realization of that character feels really necessary. Like if you yeah. watch a production at the moment of Donald Trump and it doesn't look or feel like Donald Trump, that would feel odd. But I guess there are other real people mm. who you can sort of have more of a creative license to explore in different ways. Where you yeah. don't feel like you won't be hitting audience satisfaction. Right, and with Donald Trump, there's no ambiguity about who he is. We, we've, you know, had more than enough of who he is. <laughs> We all know who he is. So there's no sort of mystery about the guy, is there? Um, whereas, Eve, yeah, like we used the Queen earlier as, a, as an example. She's obviously been portrayed in plays and, f and films quite a lot and, and TV. And there's still something about her that's an enigma and something you can interpret. So that's, yeah, very different. And do you have a particular process when you are beginning to compile characters that you are writing? For instance, do you keep uh, sort of biographies of them in a notepad? Do you ask yourself certain questions or compile a list of facts about a character? Like, how, how is it that you prepare to write a play thinking of characters? Um, I don't keep a list of facts or, you know, details about them. Um, it's in writing that I work that out, actually, and I start and um, find that there's not enough detail in a scene or a character feels a bit flat. Um, and so then I'll go away and think a bit more about that character, where they've come from, where they're going, what they want, what's happened to them uh, and how that could affect them. Um, what about like mining the real world for inspiration? Do you ever sort of overhear a conversation on a bus or something and write down dialogue? Yeah, totally. Really into eavesdropping. <laughs> I really think that's a valuable, um, a valuable tool. Um, I guess in terms of understanding the rhythms with which people speak and what information they give up readily to certain individuals. It's sort of helpful if you overhear conversations, isn't it, sometimes? Yeah, yeah, I think a trap that I definitely fall into, uh, that's easy to fall into, is making all my characters speak in the same way. Uh, it, there's no differentiation between the way they speak. And uh, again, using that scene I mentioned that's in the film as an example, Polari Gordon is a good 50 years older than the main character and he speaks in this very distinct way, in a very rhythmic kind of um, lyric way. And uh, the main character uh, was raised in a Medway town in Kent and has, moved, and has, you know, sort of couch surfed through London for several years. So he's got a completely different register of speech and um, would make different allusions, you know, reference different things in his speech. That's a really good tell of a character is what kind of things they their, their cultural sphere their cu cultural references um yeah so mining for dialogue certainly but like i always also i was always with my headphones in and i'm sort of on the bus or something and i see a sort of vignette play out on the street and <laughs> i don't know what's going on in those people's lives and i don't know what the truth of the situation is but i can apply a story to it and I just love doing that and imagining what might be going on there. And I think that's a good practice to get into. Don't stare too long. That might get a bit <laughs> weird, but yeah. Um, have you been given any advice 
in particular that you've held on to in terms of writing characters from either like a writer or an actor? Is there anything that sticks to mind that's a really good piece of advice that you've received? Um, I guess the, the part of the benefit of being an actor and having acted in new plays by writers like James Graham or Tom Morton Smith at the RSC in uh, Oppenheimer, which was about the construction of the atomic bomb. Um, I guess rather than, I didn't pester them for advice when I was <laughs> in there play in their rehearsal rooms, but I watched quite closely and the ability to collaborate and um, adapt. Um, I think it's very hard to know who to share your work with. I don't think you should share it with whoever. I think it's important to, if, if, if you trust someone and you, and, you, and you ask for, you know, constructive notes on, on something, if you feel you need to share it with someone, think select that person carefully don't just sort of I never I would never send anything to my mum for example <laughs> sorry mum because <laughs> I just you know I I I, I wouldn't want there's, there's too much of a sort of personal relationship there and I don't I don't want to sort of um put that pressure on her to kind of you know come up with insight um we've got a uh, podcast as well as a part of the 37 plays project and in that podcast, Mark Ravenhill interviews various writers, and a lot of them spoke about that same uh, feeling like you have to share work quite early and actually it making you very, very vulnerable, and also feeling quite resistant to notes as well and not feeling in a place where actually you're ready to receive that feedback. So I think that is a really helpful piece of mm -hmm. advice to get the piece of writing to a stage where you feel you've exhausted all your ideas and you feel really confident about what you've written and then ready to take feedback. It's not helpful for either the person who's written it or the yeah. person trying to give feedback if you're not quite ready for that. Yeah, I think if you're lost with a piece early on, look inwards or look outwards, look further outwards, research, uh, turn over some ideas, think about people, think about character. Um, I think it's when you've really gone through that and through a lot of soul searching and character searching and getting stuff on the page and you feel like actually yeah I do want some eyes on this I think you'll know when you when you when you're ready for that don't preempt that because as you say it's a, it can be a very vulnerable stage early on to want to sort of show people and they might you know have had a long day and they read it and they go yeah I, I don't know don't really get it and you're sort of Ooh. you know a bit crushed by that so yeah don't rush to uh share it when you don't when you feel you don't need to i mentioned earlier that your debut play cruise yes uh was and will be again produced in the west end your olivier nominated play um that wasn't the first play that you've written though oh no so i wondered if you could talk a little bit about mm. your writing journey and uh yeah. yeah give us a little bit more detail yes so um i mean i wrote when i was at school and really enjoyed it and then uh, discovered acting and uh, went to drama school and focused very much on acting for those three years and then the years afterwards but it wasn't quite scratching the itch that writing always did for me so I uh, I'd obviously worked a lot with plays and scripts so I had an understanding of how they worked and I sent a submission to the Royal Court and got onto their Royal Court Young Writers program which was, is a really it was a really good program to just make you write regularly. And that was it. it the main thing uh, was just having to turn up with something every week and having that deadline each week to have your writing read by other people. And when you really hadn't focused on it for a week, you could tell when people read it out, you'd hear it back and kind of cringe. Um, and seeing the wealth of ideas that other people had and the different ways people used form and theatre and, and structure. Um, and at the end of that, I wrote a play and the Royal Court read it and did not put it on. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I was sad about that, but also uh, got it because it was, it was not my best work ever. Um, and then uh, since then I wrote bits and pieces and when I was acting at the RSC, I did a reading of a play and then that's, I didn't, nothing happened with it. So I put it 
in my drawer with all my other plays. And um, then, you know, acting took over and I was busy with acting and never really had the time to settle down and focus on writing. Um, and then the pandemic hit and I had to stay indoors. I had no excuses to not write. And uh, I started with free writing every morning, uh, doing my morning pages is what they're called if you're doing the program called The Artist's Way. Three pages of free writing every morning without fail. And they segued into Cruise, what would become my play. And um, my partner said that when he watched it, he said, he watched the show and he said, that play is just everything. Is, is in, you've put everything into it. Every reference, every lesson I've ever learned, every character I've ever met, I just threw it all in. The, the kitchen sink included. It was just all in there and all mixed around and then put on stage. And I mean, I performed it as well, so I couldn't have done more. Um, and yeah, so the point is, <laughs> there's a lot that goes before. I don't want that to put you off <laughs> because I want you to write and submit plays. And, uh, you know, an element to it was that I wrote a play. The, the first play I properly wrote, I was only 23 and I hadn't really done much living. And the 10 years since then, I've done a lot more living and a lot more listening and a lot more. There's a lot more in the, you know, I call it the mental soup, you know, there's just this big kind of soup sloshing around with all the ideas and the people and the words and <laughs> the images. Um, yeah, it all, it all, it's all valuable. And you guys, I mean, I've already seen, you know, and read your writing today and I know that there's just so much to draw on. So don't hold back. Brilliant. With that in mind, I think we'll just open it up to some questions. I might come to you first with your question. I've always found it useful to read as much as possible around anything that I am writing. Would you advise reading plays, stage plays and screenplays, to get a feel for how they, they get put together and how they, they flow and move? Absolutely. I think um, there's, uh, on one level, in terms of like uh, seeing how a play looks on a page, I'm sure you've all seen that, but. Um, even between different writers and different publishing houses and different theatres, it looks different, which should be liberating because there's no one way it has to look, but there are some, you know, building blocks that should be in there. That also helps in terms of the readers at the RSC who are going to read it. You want it to be very easy to read for them. So um, if you sort of follow the rules of how a play looks on a page, that will help them. Um, I'm sure they'll be very kind readers there <laughs> but yeah yeah definitely. As, as much as you can do to help also uh, with that sometimes i'm really surprised when i read plays at how imaginative character description and stage directions can be and how actually that really builds upon the story and the understanding of that uh play that someone has given to you rather than just infusing all the dialogue with all of your imaginative juices and then discarding anything for the stage directions or character descriptions. And sometimes reading other people's work is a good way to sort of give yourself permission to enliven those extra bits as well that yeah. people tend to forget I about. Totally, I was reading some plays for a playwriting competition a couple of weeks ago and some of the character descriptions at the beginning were very brief and I was therefore reading it and picking up clues about them as I went in. But some of them were very detailed and so I went into the reading already sure of who was going to walk onto stage and when. So that's, again, that's part of the writing process. That's up to you. That's something you can play with. Yeah, I think specificity is your ally. And I think uh, reading a lot of other people's plays is a helpful way to understand how some people have done specificity really brilliantly. And in terms of reading other things for research, if there are uh, plays uh, or films that have been written about a similar theme or in a similar area, I used to be very cautious about reading things in this, a similar area for fear of being drawn to just copy. But I am less worried about that these days. I just think, I think trust yourself to have your voice and write your version of it. And I think often if you want to write about something, 
seeing something in the same area will provide a sort of boundary or a bit of, or, or, or will, if anything, repel you from doing that. You go, yeah, I, I see what they've done there, but I actually want to take it in this direction. So I think it can be really useful. Um, and, you know, so much of great art is borrowing and reassembling and repurposing and repackaging. And I think that's, uh, I think, be at peace with that. And access sometimes to live theatre can be tricky. So your local library or online is often a good place to find plays that you can read as well if you can't make it to live theatre. Yes. Um, take the next question. Um, I've got two. One, I'm going to sneak this the first one, in which is could you give us some examples of compelling characters, your favourite compelling characters off stage and screen? And then I was really interested in when you were talking about your, uh, your journey as a, as a writer being informed by that as a performer. And I'm wondering if when you're writing and that kind of creative process, you're visualising the play, you're visualising the story as it might be staged. Yes. So I wish, like a politician, I'd taken notes. Yeah, and then, uh, yes, your first question. Um, <laughs> compelling characters, yeah. Um, well, <laughs> In terms of Shakespeare, my favourite Shakespearean character is um, Iago from Othello. For years I've always played the lover, which is so boring, because you sort of, all you're doing is pursuing a person and you're always talking from here and Shakespeare writes, oh, I, me, woe is me, oh, oh, Hermia, it's all so up here. Whereas if you're a jealous character like Iago, it's all from here and it's all consonant driven and bitter and angry and uh, the dissembling he has to do is so much more fun. He has to to, to, to certain people, he has to keep a front up and then as soon as they're out of the room it all drops and he turns to the audience and he tells you exactly what's going on. I just think that's so exciting to perform as an actor but also for an audience to see a character and make that turn and without using soliloquy you can do that in you know, scene to scene, how a uh, character behaves with their parents and then how they behave with their friends, for example. You know, all these different facades we have. Um, contemporary characters, uh, I, I mean, I, <laughs> this, is, this is directly from the film that we've made that's <laughs> going to be on, uh, on the RSC website, but um, I took a lot of inspiration for Cruz, which is me multi-rolling. I, I took a lot of inspiration from uh, Fleabag, Phoebe Waller-Bridge's Fleabag that obviously was originally a play and then she adapted it into the TV show. And I really liked uh, how, again, how changeable her character was and how deeply inconsistent and flawed and messy and real and relatable and tragic and hilarious. And again, I mean, you know, she had asides to the camera and she talked to us directly and led us in on the secret. I guess characters where I feel let in and and obviously there's a lot of television characters like this at the moment like in where, where we where we follow an anti-hero where we follow some we're rooting for someone we sh we feel like we shouldn't root for in tv shows like breaking bad and ozark and loads of them it's all about the anti-hero at the moment this this person that is doing objectively the wrong thing but we still want them to get away with it um which i think is a real a, a, tri a real master, a mastery of, you know, dramatic form is when you make someone care for the wrong person or, you know, the wrong person. Your second question. When you're writing, mm. you visualise it oh, as yeah. a performer as well. Yeah, no, I'm very visual. And if anything, that's my <laughs> downfall is that I'm, you know, I'm so visual, I can, I, have, I can see it on the stage. In fact, that was, once I'd been doing my morning pages for my free writing for a sort of month or so, I woke up one morning and the first image I, image I had was of me on stage with a neon sign that said cruise above it. And I had this image of this, of me doing this monologue about Soho in the eighties based on this true story I'd heard when I was at Switchboard. Um, and I'd always wanted to tell this story and it sort of all fused in my mind. And then my morning pages that morning were really just all about the play. And it seems crazy that the whole play sprung from that sort of visual, that snapshot I had, but it was so vivid that I was like, yeah, it's gotta be, gotta be that. 
Um, so visual really helps me, but obviously it's the, the, the translating that into text that then someone else will visualize is the challenge. <laughs> Brilliant. And did you have a question as well? Yeah. As a book writer, not a playwright, do you have a story plot in your mind before you write the screenplay? And do you write a story plot and then a screenplay? Or do you just go straight into screenplay? Uh, so I think part of the reason my early plays are still in my desk is because I didn't plan enough and now I'm at the stage where I really try and hold back the instinct to write as long as possible because I, I just want to start writing and, and you know and playing the scenes out and seeing how these characters work but what I found it works for me is a is is planning as much as possible until I really just have to write and then I might have to go back to planning or change some bits of the plan I usually write on index cards the sort of the story beats. So this character is going to start here, go through these different scenes and then end there. And I might get more detailed than that. What needs to happen in this scene? Who's going to be there? Where it's going to be? What time? And I really then try and write it. Lots of writers work completely the opposite way around. They write it from start to finish and then they go, ooh, I need to actually go back and put in some <laughs> structure or some detail um, as a really frustrating answer. But, but you don't <laughs> actually write a storyline before you turn it into the play. I mean, more as you don't put the book before the film. I know. definitely don't write the, as, anything as extensive as like a book, you know, but I, I would probably write a brief synopsis. And certainly in the TV writing I'm doing more and more of, the requirement is that you write a one-line synopsis, then a paragraph synopsis, then a page synopsis, which is a really good exercise to go through. If you can boil your play down into one line, then that's great. And then if you can expand upon it in into a compelling paragraph, great. And then a compelling page. And then you might get to that stage where you're like, oh, I need to write the scenes now. Um, we might have time for one more question. Yes, please. Um, can, can, I mean, you're obviously very talented. Oh, and, um, I, I, I don't know if you're aware of this, but um, Andrew Lloyd Webber did a report about 10 years ago about access to the theatre and access to playwriting and, and um, acting. And he said that there were a lot of barriers to working class people and ethnic minorities to the theatre. In your experience, do you think that somebody living on a council estate in Newcastle um, with a, a, a driver degree from Sunderland Polytechnic, do you think they'd be able to follow in your footsteps? Do, do you think that, that playwriting is a meritocracy and that if you're good, if you're talented, like you, that, that somebody from a poor estate could still follow in your footsteps? Uh, I like to think so. I certainly don't think it's as, it's not a pure meritocracy. Uh, there are elements of it that are a long way from a meritocracy. There are so many schemes that are blind entry, you know, um, anonymous submissions, which, are, which is great. But where do you get the time to write the whole play for free? That's a, the first barrier to entry. Um, I mean, I could get lyrical and histrionic and talk about playwrights like Joe Orton, who was raised, um, you know, in a council estate in Leicester and went on to become a very celebrated playwright and, you know, is really the pride of, of Leicester. And um, there are always ways through. And I think, you know, schemes like the 37 plays are going to be really valuable because they encourage, they, they completely eliminate all those bars to entry. and. I, th I think 100% everybody has a play within them, without a shadow of a doubt, that's true. It's, it's sadly those, those functional basic things to getting to that stage. And I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm you know, a, a privileged person in my own way, and still the only way I got my play written was when the whole world shut down and, I was, and I, I was lucky enough to not be a frontline worker, so I had to just sit in my house and write it. A lot of it is just getting that time to sit down and do it. And that's the hardest thing. I mean, but you know, one of my favorite uh, 
authors, um, Hanya Yanagihara, she's an uh, American uh, writer, she wrote her incredible first novel called A Little Life in and around her very busy day job. Every evening, she was, she was just pursued it mercilessly. She'd go home every night, write until midnight, go to bed, wake up, go to her job every night. And she wrote this mind-blowingly good book. And I'd say conversely, a lot of people who have the, the time, the money, the privilege, the access, don't necessarily have the stories to draw on. And I think, you know, the story is the thing. Do you, do you think the working class experience, though, is sort of um, theatrically attractive to um, the theatre and to the Royal Court and the Royal Shakespeare Company? Absolutely, yeah. Um, I think we're in a, f a funny stage in theatre. I think it's, it's, there was definitely a real, you know, like the, um, the John Osborne era, the kitchen sink drama, it had its real, like, moment, didn't it? And then it's sort of, we're sort of in this strange kind of working out, you know, what, what the balance is on stage. Um, but I think we're definitely in a period of broadening out voices who are, we are seeing on our stages, and there's a real embracing of that that is happening. To your point about career accessibility, I think that's a really tricky question. I guess part of the 37 Plays project as well, one of the factors about that that we're really excited by is just how enriching writing can be to anyone. And I think the workshop that we did this morning, writing in any capacity, it sort of instills you with a self-confidence and a new lens of which to see the world, which I think is beneficial to anyone. And I don't want to be um, short-sighted or limited in the way that I'm answering your question, but I think if we as a nation can once again sort of embrace how important writing is and expression that benefits everyone and then i sort of support what jack said about the particularities of you know how difficult it is for access but um yeah i think those in the industry are definitely supportive of more voices being uh, given a platform uh, going off at a tangent slightly personal are you a daydreamer and if you are do your daydreams link at all to what you produce? That's a really good question. I think a, a daydream is a very healthy habit. Uh, and I think I, um, I, I, I sometimes daydream for a while. <laughs> and it's usually what brings me, it's usually the thing that brings me out of the daydream is when I go, oh, that's quite a good idea. Or, oh, that could go there. Or, that was the thing I was thinking of. It's when I really try to think about what I need to put in the play to make it work, that it doesn't work. No. And it's when I sort of let myself drift off that something just comes in from, you know, left field and sort of, I think, oh, better write that down. Always keep a notebook with you, always, you know. Well, the question was stimulated from two things. One, both of you mentioned imagination a lot. And, yeah. and I think the two are linked. Yeah. And also the particular incident that you mentioned, you woke up one morning, you had this visual image. Mm. I, I know that was waking up. And it was mm. different yeah, things. yeah. But that's the, the artist's way, which I mentioned earlier, which I'd you know, recommend you have a look at. It's part of that free writing that we did earlier. It's about depositing ideas and not being precious about them coming out. And it's about letting ideas in so you do these things called artist dates where you take, you know, you watch a film you love or you read a book or you go for a walk and see the sights, whatever. You know, it's about putting stuff in and mixing it all up in the soup and letting it all come out. <laughs> Very good. That feels like a great place to end on a little bit of daydreaming so i might just say thank you very much to jack holden for joining us today and thank you everyone <laughs>